All right, um, let's get started. We're going to really quickly, um, uh, really quickly finish the, uh, the, um, the discussion that we left off uh, last time. Real quick, from Sealed Zone, did everybody sign the sign-in sheet who's in steel? I, I started it over here. I know you, you were here, and so you were here, so. All right, I'll, I'll pass the steel one around again if you were here. <laughs> Go ahead. I guess. Go ahead and start this one around. Um, we're going to really quickly finish the example that we did with long-term deflections on Monday because I want to get into our sort of our next big topic, which is the concept of development length. Um, because it, it, it's something that uh, some professors uh, who teach concrete design, some of them choose to cover it, some of them don't. I tend to think it's kind of important. It's not a very technically complicated topic, but it's worth mentioning. But real quick, let me just real quickly go over the, uh, the long-term deflection stuff and get back into our example. So we've been talking about deflections, and we've been talking about the, the difference between immediate deflections and long-term deflections, how over time deflections tend to increase. Now, we know how to compute immediate live load deflection, but we also need to know how to compute total long-term deflection. So, you know, it's a function of, you know, uh, the percent of uh, amount of, well, when it comes to the dead load, that load is obviously going to be there, so our load modification is going to be based off of infinite duration. But for long-term effects, it's a function of the uh, amount of duration and then how much of that live load is sustained. Now we can also incorporate uh, reinforcement ratios for the compression steel if we want. Uh, and if you have compression steel there, you might as well. All it's going to do is give you a benefit. <coughs> so our amplification factor for uh, long-term effects is, as you see here, it's a function of the time-dependent factor and the reinforcement ratio. That time-dependent factor you can get from the following curve. This is taken right out of the specification. Um, these are some values in the table that are, you know, on, off certain increments. For anything else, just go off the curve and find the closest value. Um, so if we wanted to compute the total deflection, the total deflection, we need the dead load, the live load, and the sustained live load, which you can't calculate live load deflection or sustained live load deflection directly. You can subtract it out from the dead load, but you can't compute it deflect, uh, directly. But we, we've already talked about that. To get the total deflection, you take your immediate live load deflection, you add to that the sustained effect from dead loads and the sustained effect from how much live load is always going to be present. So we take the dead load deflection and multiply it by the following factor, which is at the very least, or at the very most, two, although it can drop if you've got compression steel, and then your uh, sustained live load is multiplied by whatever that duration is. Now, as for your limits, your limits are either based off of immediate live load deflection or the total deflection as you see here. This is in your book, so it's in like chapter six. So if you, uh, if you uh, are curious about some of the footnotes, it's in there, yes. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, because if your live load is only going to be sustained for like a period of six months or 12 months, then that's the only duration you need to incorporate. The reason why I have an infinite duration factor is because there is one load that is always going to be there no matter what, and that's the dead loads. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Is that good? Okay. So. Here's our, our limits. Our limits are discretized based on whether we're dealing with uh, roof members or floor members and whether or not um, we're looking at immediate deflections or total deflections. And then we, we were doing this example and we kind of rushed through some of it and we're going to do a, a few calculations today, but I think it's going to be fairly quick. So we're looking at the, the beam that we did before, the parameters in uh, 14a. We calculated immediate live load deflection and I want to know if it's going to meet requirements for immediate and long-term deflections. So <coughs> um, it's a floor beam. It's likely to be damaged by deflections. We're going to consider that 30 percent of the live load is going to be sustained and that's to be sustained over a period of three years. Okay. So and again 
Remember when we said, the, uh, you know, where do you get that 30% and that sustained period for three years? Where do you get that? Do you look it up in some table or some spec? That's just engineering judgment based on the problem you're looking at. Okay. All right. Now, back to the example. We looked at 14A and we said, all right, we've got dead and live load deflection, which we calculated the live load by subtracting those two. And then here's all our relevant material properties and cracking moments and moments of inertia and all of that. We've got our live loads and what have you. So we did, this is what we did in example 14A. We did a dead load deflection calculation. We did a dead plus live. So last time I did the dead plus 30% of live, but I did it kind of quickly. But is that okay? I mean, were you all all right with that? It was just dead plus the 30% of live. Take that to get a moment, take that moment, and then this, this, and this to get a moment of inertia, an effective moment of inertia based on how much of the beam is cracked. Take that moment of inertia, 5WL to the fourth over 384 EI. That's your W, that's your L, that's your modulus of elasticity up there, and then unit conversions to get 0.315 inches. Sound good? All right. Let me find this example in my notebook so I can know what I'm going off of. No, it's not. That's from, remember, 57,000 times the square root of FC prime. That was what we did last time. All right. Sound good? Okay, so the rest of the example, I think, is going to go really quickly. All right. Um, so, let's say... Um, Long-term multipliers, I guess I'll call it. I'm doing this problem in a little bit of a different order than what I had on my example, but I think it makes a little more sense. Long-term multiplier. All right. Let's go back to 14A. Does this beam have any compression steel in it at all? No, it does not. So if it has no compression steel at all, what is rho prime? Remember rho prime, rho prime, bleh, rho prime is the uh, area of compression steel divided by the effective area in the beam. If there is no compression steel in the beam, what is rho prime? Zero. So rho prime is zero. And that is because there is no compression steel. All right. So now what we do for our um, uh, multiplier is we take our made-up symbol xi, right? Because you all thought I just made that symbol up out of thin air, the little weird squiggle mark thing. We take that and we divide it by 1 plus 50 times uh, rho prime, which is 0. So that means we need to look up those, uh, those time duration factors. Now, I can do a couple of, or one of them pretty easily. All right. Now, we have a multiplier for an infinite duration, which is what? It's 2 divided by 1 plus 50 rho prime, right? I mean, y'all with me on that one? because I'm, I'm going to pull that up. Because I'm going off of this one. I'm, I'm looking at these two, uh, these two multipliers right here. So this is the one for infinite duration, and this is the one for a given duration. All right? So so this is going to be 2 divided by 1 plus 50 times 0, which is, which is 2, right? Now, we also need to do the one for the sustained live loads. Now, 30% of the live load was sustained, but for how long? Three years. So, what does the, what's the multiplier? One point four and 2. If you had to look at that graph, so, did everybody see? All right, so let me go back to the slideshow. Um, 
here's the slideshow. It's going to be somewhere between, well, well, you said, wait, 1.4 and 1.2. Oh, 1.4 and 2. Okay, all right, sorry. I thought you said 1.4 and 1.2. Um, we're looking at three years, which is 36 months, right? That's about what, right here. Um, to keep it simple, let's round to the nearest tenth. So what are we looking at? About 1.8? Something like that? Does that sound good? All right. Y'all see where I'm getting at? 36 months. Here's our time-dependent factor, and we're about there. So, let's see. So we have our modifier for infinite duration. If we do our modifier for three years, it's probably going to be 1.8 divided by 1 plus 50 times naught, which is 1.8. Make sense? Any questions? All right, you need me to leave this up or am I good to move on? You want me to hold on for a little bit? Sound good? Okay. Go back to 14A. How much compression steel is in that beam? Now, what is rho prime? It's the area of steel and compression divided by BD. No area of steel and compression, no rho prime. That, that's, that's fine. I mean, I want to make sure everybody's following through with that. Uh, no, I understand. All right, everybody good with this? Am I good to move on? Okay. So, all right. So, therefore, if I do total deflection, my delta total is my live load deflection plus my dead load deflection but amplified and amplified based off of infinite duration and then plus my uh, sustained live load but then amplified based off of whatever duration that is which is three years. So that is, what was my live load deflection? It was 0.223, is that what it was? All right, plus uh, be better now. my infinite multiplier, which what is that? Two. Two times dead load deflections. What were the dead load deflections? Plus, and then the uh, amplifier for three years, which is 1.8 times sustained live load deflection, which was 0 0.07. And then plug and chug, and that should be 0. Point, was it 839, something like that? Y'all getting that? Well, yeah, yeah, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain what we're ultimately going to interpret, interpret the, from that here in a minute. Okay? What we've done so far is we've calculated two really key values of interest. In 14A, we computed the immediate deflection due to live loads. In this example, we computed the total deflection. So now what we're going to do is compare those against the associated limits here in a second.
Y'all getting this? Okay. So, I don't know what happened there. All right. So let's look at deflection limits. All right. Let's start off with the immediate. or the instantaneous deflection. That immediate instantaneous live load deflection was 0 0.223. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, everybody good? All right, is it all right if I move away from this for a second? Okay. Where is it? Right there. Okay. Let's read this. Okay, so we've got flat roofs of, let's read the first one. Flat roofs not supporting or attached to non-structural elements uh, likely to be damaged. Now, floors not supporting likely to be damaged. Um, probably, probably that second one. L over 360, right? Does that make sense? We're looking at a floor element, right? Make sense? All right, so, hold on. I keep wanting to do that full screen keep, uh, command in PowerPoint, and it doesn't work. So, what we've got here is an immediate live load deflection limit. What we need to do is compare that against delta, oh goodness, what happened there? We need to compare that against delta max, which in this case, since we're talking about an interior floor element and we're looking at immediate deflections, is L over 360, which is what? How long is this beam? 20 foot, but in inches, 240 inches divided by 360, and that's what? What's that? Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah, it's 0 0.67. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, um, this is how much deflection I'm actually getting in the beam. This is how much I am allowed. What does that mean? There we go. Now, for the total, however, 0 0.839, and you all have the guide in front of you, if you're looking at total deflection in floor beams, the limit's going to be L over 480, okay? Roof beams, you're looking at L over 240, Is that my, am I remembering that right? You all have it in front of you, you tell me. For the roofs, it's L over 240, for the floor beams, 480, right? making you all actually read the tables. Goodness. Man, who do I think I am? Is that right, 480? Do you all not see it, or? Is, is it not legible on the slide? Oh, oh, okay, that's, that's right, I'm sorry. This one's where it's likely to be damaged. We're looking at the 480. I'm sorry. It's in your book. Do you all have your book with you? Yeah, I'm, man, I'm going to have to remember, that, man, I need to put in the syllabus, like, I reserve the right to assign pop quizzes. They're like, man, your SEI has just went down. <laughs> I don't know about all that. Remember calculators with Wi-Fi connections. I'm not, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not a, me a me mechanical professor. All right, delta max is L over 480. I tell you what, I tell you what, if you can't read that, that's a good, a good point to bring up. Would you all like me to uh, put a larger one on the blackboard? A larger, okay, I can do that. I, I apologize, I, I thought it was legible, so I, I'm sorry about that. So L over 480, 240 inches over... 
480 is what? Which means what? <laughs> Which is it? We're not good. This being fails deflection limits. Now, you all are engineers. You tell me. If a beam fails deflection limits, what do we do to that beam? No, we don't. No, that's, that's a good, good point. We don't make it stronger. Stronger in this class would mean add reinforcement. Would that do anything? How would adding, that's a good, good point to bring up though. How would adding reinforcement affect this? It wouldn't, right? So what can we do to this beam to improve its performance in deflections? Well, make, okay, so there, there you go. That, yeah, if we're looking at the, the, the effects going into it, that's, that's a potential option. Now, you said camber it. Well, cambering it's a, you know, you could kind of account for, for some of that deflection, but what if, what if it's not the, uh, the dead load deflections that's an issue? It's not, we're still dancing around the, the, what do we do to the beam? Now, you could say make it shorter, but maybe that's not an option. Maybe the columns are here, and this is where the beam is going. Or this room would get thinner, yeah, or something, something like that. I, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. Tell people not to worry about it. It's just, it's just a, well, you may, I mean, at least you're, you're the, the point that it's not a safety concern. No, but what I'm asking is what do we do to the dimensions of the beam? Thicker. Okay, what, what do you mean by that? But my point is it's the moment of inertia. We need to take the moment of inertia and make it larger, right? If we take the moment of inertia and make it larger, deflections go down, right? Maybe take the beam and make it deeper. But does that, does that make sense? I want you to understand that just throwing rebar into it isn't going to fix the problem. It's not going to do anything, okay? I really want, I mean, if you do a problem, or if you're doing a design and it fails in deflection, you've got to know what to do to that beam to make it pass, okay? Deflections? Make it deeper, you know. Increase that moment of inertia. Strength, change your reinforcement pattern. Maybe then make it a little deeper. See what I mean? This is just points to make. Um, how about this? What if you don't have any room to make it deeper? What if you don't have any room to make it deeper and throwing reinforcement isn't going to fix it and you can't make it shorter, then what? What's that? Well, no, you can't, well, what if you have no room? Well, no, seriously, what if you have no room? What if you have, okay, that beam can only be 12 inches deep. It can't be any, I mean, what can you do then? That might change your E a little bit. Brace it. What if we threw more beams in there? In other words, let's say this floor system, let's say this is a bay, and there's only three beams in this bay. What if I throw an extra beam line in there? An extra beam line is going to mean less tributary width. Less tributary width means less load on that beam. Less load on that beam means less deflection. Got to think about these things. There goes the wonderful world of iteration. You're exactly right. Because now the loads have increased. You're, you're the the self-weight of the building has increased. And that might actually become a big issue for like your columns and what have you. So. But you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Welcome to the iterative effect of structural engineering. This is the stuff I want you all to think about, okay? This is important stuff. You think there's no iteration in geotech? <laughs> What's that? I don't think it was iteration. <laughs> okay.
Okay, this was a beam that we assume was likely to be damaged by deflections. Why did you assume that? Because it was that's the problem. I put that in the problem. It says right there. Okay. So roof or floor construction. So if I'm looking at the third and fourth one, the third and fourth one are the ones considering total deflection. So we say, all right, roof or floor attached to elements likely to be damaged and then not likely to be damaged. That's where that came into play. The top two was if we're looking at roof systems or floor systems. Not necessarily. Does just it just happen to come out that way? Not necessarily. All right. Let me see what time it is. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. So this is the point in concrete design where some professors do think do some set of topics, some professors do another. Um, there, there are some professors who, when they teach concrete design, like to say at this point, let's look at footing design or, or uh, retaining wall design. You know, so <laughs> y'all are looking at me with these evil eyes. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, what I mean by retaining wall design, for those of you that have had foundations, is you all who have had foundations and looked at retaining wall design know about active earth pressures versus passive earth pressures and all of that. And, and what you're trying to do in that mode of thinking is ensure that the foundation isn't going to slide, that it's not going to overturn, and, and all of that. What we would be concerned with is, okay, here's this retaining wall. How much rebar needs to go in it? How do we lay it out? How do we do this? How do we figure out how much rebar needs to go in a shallow footing? and what have you. I mean, you take a foundations course, all you determine is how deep that foundation is and how wide it is, and that's it. Here, you actually need to determine the rebar if, if we go down that path. The reason why I don't cover it is technically a lot of it's not the most challenging thing in the world, that's part A, and part B, I'm not covering geotech again, okay? We have, I mean, you all take geotechnical engineering to cover that, you don't need me to talk about it again. So what I decided to do is talk about something else, which I think is just as important in the world of civil engineering and in the world of reinforced concrete design, which is development length. A lot of times people don't talk about it. It's not technically a very complex topic, but it's really important. And it's one of those things that a lot of practicing engineers, they get out of this class and they, they don't even think about this. But this is real practical stuff and real... Um, issues that need to be addressed on a lot of civil engineering construction projects. Now let me kind of explain what I mean when I look at development length and maybe try and approach this problem uh, a little practically. Okay, so, all right, let's say we've got this beam. Okay, let's just keep it simple. Let's say we've got this beam. Now that we've got a beam, uniformly distributed load, here's the material. I've got six bars, which by the way, I think you all need these handouts. Probably a good idea, right? Probably a good idea. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so. Here we've got this uh, beam. It's got a uniformly distributed load, and it's got six bars in it, okay? Now, you all should know how to do this, right? Moment diagram, WL squared over 8, you get 618-something foot kits, right? So when you determine the design strength of this beam, and you determine uh, whether or not phi MN is greater than or equal to MU, so far in this class we've been doing it based off that number, right? Make sense? But that number only occurs right here, right? Like here, the moment's, I don't know, 150, 200 foot kip, something about like that. Do you really need six bars right here? No, you don't. So maybe what we do is we look at this a little differently. Maybe we go back to some of that stuff you all learned in structural analysis, uh, and we say, all right, let's cut a section and let's look at what does the moment diagram look like. Remember, it's a parabola, right? Cut a section with the samurai sword and or lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan. And you say, all right, 
I've got the reaction times some distance x, which is W u L over 2. I've got the distributed load, which is W u times that width of x, multiplied by a moment arm of x over 2. And I've got the internal moment inside the beam. Remember, some of the moments going that way, all the moments going this way has to equal all the moments going that way. Right? And then we can get an expression for moment as a function of x. We can say, all right, let's see if we can actually cut those bars down a little bit. Now, if we use six bars and we say, all right, the moment capacity is ASFY D minus A over 2 times whatever phi is, right? We say, well, if I use six bars, that's my area. I go through and plug and chug. That's what I'm going to get as my moment capacity. If I use four bars, my area drops down, and plug and chug, do all the math, and this is what I get as my moment capacity. Plug and chug, da da da, da. this is what I get as my moment capacity, right? Make sense? Okay, all right. So what I can do is I can say, okay, where do those moments occur on the moment diagram? Sort of, you know, back calculate and solve, and I get that this moment here, this 438 foot kips, occurs at about 6.92 feet, and then the one with two bars occurs at about 3.13 feet. See, the point I'm trying to make is this, is that really what we've been doing up until now is using the moment at mid-span and saying, well, we're going to use those bars everywhere in the beam, but you really don't need to, right? You really don't need four, you know, those six bars all the way back to the support because they're not doing anything, really, uh, or they're not, they're not contributing to the economy of the beam. Really, theoretically, what you could do is you could cut those b uh, bars off a little bit. You could cut uh, the number fours off here, and then, or the, the, the four bars there, and the two bars uh, up to the end of the support. Does that make sense? You don't need those six bars across the entire span. Make sense? Yes. So really well, we're getting we're we're getting into another problem that I'm that I'm going to say why we don't do this. We're getting into another problem. Okay. Well, no, no, no. The problem that we're getting into is development length. Well, we're getting into a problem of development length. Okay, so quick question. How many um, people in here are, are fans of uh, like a tug of war competition? How many people are fans? Oh, okay. All right, all right. This guy's over here. Okay, so I've got this umbrella. All right, help me out. So you and I are going to have a tug of war competition, okay? Now, Here's the deal. I get to grab as much of the umbrella as I want. You can only grab from here up. Go. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a different development length problem altogether. But, and that's all sticky. So, actually, no, it's not. It's not. Not. Here, okay. Okay, grab this in right here. Okay. All right. Now, go. Okay, you weren't going to win, right? I mean, I know I'm a, a, you know, a, a really intimidating kind of guy. I, I understand that. But you were never going to win, right? It doesn't matter how strong you are. You, he was never going to win. Why? No, had, or, well, what do you mean by that? He didn't, exactly. He didn't have as much of a grip on, on the umbrella as I did. I was able to hold the whole thing. He only had that little bit, and he, he didn't have enough of a grip on it. Now, if he was actually able to hold you know, a fair amount of it, then it'd be a different story, right? Okay, make sense? All right, so, I mean, you all have seen rebar before. It's got these little ribs on it, right? These little, little sort of ridges that are, you know, evenly spaced along the length of the bar. They're there for a reason, right? Why are they there? They're there so that when you cast the concrete around the bar, the concrete grips those bars, and now you have a bond between them. Okay, now, so that bond actually matters. Now, what I'm asking is this. Let's go back to this original example. Okay, now, you, you hold on to that. Okay, now, he's got this you know, at the very end. Let's say I do the same thing, okay? We're probably both efforting the same amount, right? Now, let's say I grip a little more, okay? Maybe I'm doing a little better. Maybe I grip a little more. There is a point when it doesn't matter how much I grip, I'm still going to win every time, okay? The idea is when I'm looking at rebar, there is a point where if I take this rebar, let's say I have this big mass of concrete and I've got a piece of rebar in my hand and I cast it 
such that that rebar is embedded into that concrete like a quarter of an inch. I'm just going to be able to yank it right out, right? What about if it's two inches? Maybe I got to give it a little bit of oomph, but I can yank it right out. There is a point when maybe if I embed it you know, 20 inches, 30 inches, 40 inches, there is a point when it stops mattering how much I have embedded that bar into the concrete. I have embedded it far enough such that I have developed the full capacity of that bar. In other words, to yank that bar out of the concrete, I have to exceed Fy times the area, right? Make sense? What we're concerning ourselves with right now is what's called the development length. How far a piece of bar must be embedded into a given element in order to ensure that we fully develop the strength of the section. Make sense? <coughs> let, me, let me come up with a, uh, an example to kind of define that a little more uh, effectively. Let me, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. This right here. Okay. So let's say I have a cantilevered beam, right, and I have load on the top. Remember, I put the bars on the top, not the bottom, right? Because if this is a party deck and there's a dance floor up here and you don't put the bars up top, those people on the dance floor aren't going to have time to whip, let alone nay-nay, that they are just going to fall right down. In other words, we have to place those bars up top because that's the region that's in tension, right? But what we haven't discussed is, well, what do I do? Do I just put the bars right there and then that's it? I mean, there is a lot of tensile force right here at this interface. If those bars aren't embedded into the concrete, it doesn't matter that you put the bars out there. It's going to go, right? Those bars have to go back into that column some amount, right? How far do they go back? Well, that's what we're asking ourselves right now. How far is that development length? How far must they go back such that when we do a, a FEMN calc and we say, well, the tensile force is AS times FY, how far does that have to go back such that we can actually account on that? Does that make sense? Th that's really what we're kind of after right now. <coughs> okay. So when we design, when we actually do this math and we say, well, what's the tensile force? Well, it's AS, FY. We're assuming that there's enough of a bond there. Let's talk about that bond. Okay. So again, you know, you start um, embedding a piece of rebar into the concrete, there's those ribs on the bar, those ribs have forces exerted on them by the concrete, okay? So the idea is that more ribs that are in the concrete, the more force that can, can be applied, so it's all about that depth. Yes? I'm sorry, sorry what? That's a good question. And the answer is, you know, you space those ribs too closely together and the aggregates and the cementitious material inside the concrete doesn't have enough space to actually bond. Do you see what I mean? That, that, that um, I guess what I'll say, that um, effective spacing of the ribs, that's been figured out for, I, I don't know, years, you know, and that, that isn't changing anytime soon. But that's a good question. Maybe if you're using a different mix, then that number can change. So, all right. But then you're starting to get beyond like typical civil engineering applications and we're starting to get into special stuff and it's not the big picture. Okay. All right. Sound good? Now, one of the ways that we start to look at development length is we, like we start to look at anything in structural engineering is we start to ask ourselves, well, how do these things fail when you actually apply a load to them? And then maybe we'll try and write our specifications around that mode of failure. So what ends up happening is if you take a piece of you know, rebar and you place it inside a concrete element, what ends up happening is you start to yank on it. Okay? And it obviously, you know, you're going to have some regions in tension. And what does concrete like to do when it's in tension? It likes to crack, right? Now, what does that cracking you know, region look like? It, it kind of looks cylindrical in nature. It almost behaves like a, like a concrete pipe that was filled with water. When you look at your resulting cracks, they kind of look something about like this, and they tend to you know, fall within this circular region. That's what bond failures tend to look like. So you're going to see here in a little bit, when we look at this C sub B distance and this, uh, this cover distance requirement in the... Uh, in the uh, 
uh, development length calculation, you're going to see these dimensions pop up and go, ah, now I know where they're coming from. Okay? So um, that's just something to uh, preview for what's coming next. Okay. So far so good? All right. So what we're trying to do is determine how far do those bars need to be embedded into the steel such that we can develop the full capacity. I know it's a messy equation. It's not a complicated equation though. This is actually about as straightforward as it gets. This is again one of those empirical expressions. You know, you know how it goes. Um, go out, do a bunch of testing, do a bunch of data analysis and try and fit a model that represents the, the problem. Happens a lot in structural engineering, happens a lot in engineering period. This is the expression that you use to compute the development length for a given bar. The big things that are probably new are these three uh, terms on the numerator and then what's going on down here in this denominator. Everything else is bar diameters, Fy, square root of Fc prime, remember put in PSI, get out PSI, your lightweight aggregate factor, stuff you've seen before. Okay? Now these three psi factors that you see here are related to the reinforcement location, the bar coding, and then the reinforcement size. Like, um, for instance, uh, an easy one to, or an easy way to remember this is this first one is sort of related to bars on the top, top bar factor. This uh, second one, anybody ever worked on a construction site or heard of a rebar that's coated with epoxy, that green, those green bars? Well, those green epoxy coated bars, it's slick, right? Slicker than a, a, a typical uh, bare steel rebar. So what happens is you take your development length and you increase it. Because what we're saying is, well, if you've got an epoxy coated bar, you need more embedment into that concrete element in order to develop that capacity. D does that make sense? All right. And then there's a reinforcement size factor as well, based on the size of the bars that changes. All right. So let's take a look at these. Okay. Now, you go out, you go down to the laboratory and you do some tests. You find that if you've got a given beam, the bar, bars that tend to be located on the top of elements, they really just don't bond as well as the bars on below. So basically what we've got is we look at this dimension here and we say, well, if this, di if this uh, dimension is greater than or equal to 12 inches, we say that that top bar factor is 1.3. We say, ah, you need a little more length to fully develop that capacity. But if they're on the bottom, it's actually doing pretty well and we say that factor is 1. A lot of typical cases we tend to go with, uh, with 1s. All right. Make sense? Again, a lot of this is just looking at the beam and going, well, which case is it? Okay, that's 1. Which case is it? Uh, that's 1.2. Uh, this is 1.5. And then it's all plug and chug from there. Okay. Epoxy coated bars. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Epoxy coated bars are a little more slick. They, they don't bond as well as typical bare steel. Now, epoxy coated bars, they're commonly used if you've got, you know, uh, a problem with corrosion. Maybe you're doing a bridge or something out in Miami where you're near all the salt water and what have you, then it's a different story altogether. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, you know, this, this tends to be used in those types of regions. Problem is they don't bond as well. All right. So the idea is if you've got uncoated bars then, or just, you know, bare steel, well then your coating factor is one. If you've got um, epoxy coated bars with not a whole lot of cover, you know, which hopefully, you, you know, you're, you're trying to provide a, a, enough cover as possible. But if the cover is less than three bar diameters or, what did I, oh, sorry. If your cover is less than three bar diameters or your spacing is less than six bar diameters, you take the epoxy factor to be 1.5, which that also has other connotations. I mean, think about like this. That uh, cover, I mean, what is that? Remember, that's how much concrete is in between the bar surface and the edge of the beam. Or this clear spacing is between from one bar to another, right? If those dimensions are really, really small, then that means there's not a whole lot of concrete between one bar or another, or between a bar and the edge, right? If there's not a whole lot of concrete, then there's not a whole lot of grip that can be provided by that concrete. 
If there's not a lot of grip that can be provided by that concrete, well, then that means you need that bar deeper into that element in order to develop the capacity. So the factor goes up. Does that make sense? Does that concept make sense? All right. Now, the reinforcement size factor, the idea, um, <coughs> the idea is, um, the, and, and this is where a trade-off comes in engineering, but it's just something to think about. Um, let's say that you do a beam design, and let's say you do, you know, you do your calcs, and you find that the required area of steel is 5.2 square inches, okay? And you've got two options. You could choose, you know, six number nines, or I'll make this up because I, I can't remember this off the top of my head. But you choose six number nines or, I don't know, 18 number fours or something, like a ridiculous amount of small beams or a small amount of really, really or a ridiculous amount of small bars or a few, amount of, a few really big bars. Now, let's say mathematically it's the same amount of area. Same amount of steel. Um, it might be the same amount of steel from an area standpoint, but if you use fewer bars, wouldn't the surface area be larger? Or, or, or sorry, if you use more bars, wouldn't surface area be larger? More bars, more surface area. Does that make sense? So if you're in a design mode and you use more bars, you tend to get more surface area. More surface area means more room for grip. If you're ever in B or in uh, design mode and you tend to use bars that are number sixes and smaller, you find that you can actually get a benefit on your development length. So basically what this is saying is if you've got smaller bars, we can take a size factor of 0.8, otherwise we use uh, 1.0. So does that make sense, the idea that smaller bars tends to mean you need more of them more of them means more surface area. More surface area means more room for the grip, the concrete to grip. All right, make sense? Let's see what happens. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, we're starting to run short on time, so I'd rather, you know, sort of cut this off now and look at this next time. Um, so what we'll do is next time we'll delve a little bit into the world of development length. Start to look at this cover uh, requirement, which was that diameter or that function on the denominator. And it's funny how a lot of these distances are related to that cylindrical failure mode that you get when you rip those bars out. Sound good? All right, I will see you all next time. You all have fun on your celebration later this afternoon.